Hey, grade 12s, Mr. Kleiman here. Today we're going to talk about cell signaling. There's a lot to cover. Let's get right into it. This house right here is my analogy for a cell, and you can see that that cell can send and receive signals if you put the right contraption on the roof. And so let's have a look at what those contraptions might be in cells. Now there's a lot of different ways that cells can communicate with each other. One that we don't cover in a lot of detail in this course is to look at cells that are adjacent to each other or side by side. Here you can see a bunch of them that are connected directly via what we call junctions. And there's all different types of junctions. Essentially what they do is allow for either the entire cytoplasm or specific molecules from the cytoplasm of these adjacent cells to be shared between between them. Uh, another uh, one that we're going to focus on mostly today is the use of a ligand with a receptor. And of course that receptor being a protein. And so a ligand is simply a chemical that can lock into that receptor as a cue to turn it on. And when that receptor is turned on or its three-dimensional conformation is changed, uh, it can activate other proteins which ultimately cause some kind of a response in cells. That's the focus of today's lesson, but it's certainly not the end of the story of cell signaling. In a later lesson, we're going to look at the super interesting use of electrical signals uh, to communicate between cells as well that's developed in some animals. And so what you see here are incredibly highly specialized cells called neurons, and those are the main components uh, of the nervous system. An interesting side note to talk about them is that while these wires called axons will carry the electrical signals, uh, when they interface with each other, very much like ligand and receptor, we have, or they do use ligand and receptor at what we call uh, the synapse. And so what we're going to focus on today is the endocrine system. And so that simply is a collection of glands, and these glands all work together to produce a particular type of ligand called a hormone. And hormones are going to be able to alter our physiology in such a way to respond to our environment uh, in interesting ways and to change throughout development. So what exactly is a hormone? Now it's just a fancy way of saying a chemical signaling molecule that is produced specifically by a gland. And remember I just said that you can have uh, a ligand receptor response in the nervous system. Uh, and in that system, we would call the ligands neurotransmitters. And if it's made by a gland, we're going to call it a hormone. So these things are generally transported then by the blood, right? The glands release their hormones into the blood. And when they reach their target organs, uh, they're going to change their physiology or behavior. So hormones are the ligands to receptors in specific tissues in specific organs. And so the receptors on those tissues are going to detect the presence of the hormone and they're going to be responsible for orchestrating some kind of a response through what we call a signal transduction pathway. Uh, there are two main types of proteins used in the body and those are ones that are protein based and others are steroid based. Before we look at those specific types of proteins, let's just have a look at a typical signal transduction pathway. So here you can see it diagrammed out where you've got your receptor embedded into this membrane. And here you can see a hormone linking into that receptor. That's going to alter its 3D shape and now it can interact with other proteins. Maybe another protein embedded in the membrane, maybe another protein uh, that's in the cytoplasm. Uh, it may then create this uh, linkage of one protein activating the next and activating the next. So you can have uh, many of these, what we call second messengers. The first messenger of the signal is the hormone itself. And the second messenger uh, is this more mobile element, some other protein that can go to where the response is needed. And ultimately, the result of activating uh, these proteins, one or many, these second messengers, is going to create some specific change to the cell. We call that the response. So here's a nice example of it. You can see a G protein linked receptor with nothing in that receptor, meaning that it's off. And so it doesn't interact with its target, the G protein. When that signal molecule uh, is embedded in the receptor, so let's say that that's a hormone, now 
the G protein will interact with it, will go through this chemical change and become in its active form. And so now we call it a second messenger. And there may be several second messengers. Maybe it bumps into this enzyme, which is going to cause some kind of cellular response. And we can also remove those signal molecules to turn it back off. Uh, and so here's that whole process diagrammed out in a little bit more detail. You've got a hormone like epinephrine, right? This is uh, adrenaline linking into your G protein, uh, your G protein receptor, G protein is now active, goes through this whole signaling cascade, uh, which ultimately creates some specific cellular response. And so there it is, the endocrine system is going to consist of glands, and inside of those glands they will be secreting cells. And what are they secreting? Well, they're going to be secreting hormones directly into the bloodstream. And when the uh, hormones reach different organs, and remember the blood goes everywhere to every cell in your entire body, some of those cells are going to be producing the appropriate receptors, which are going to lock into those hormones and can therefore change the behavior of those cells. What I like about this diagram is that it's showing two different target cells that are perhaps in two different regions of the body. So the testosterone in my blood right now is making the hair follicles here and here respond, hopefully not here, but maybe one day, uh, but the hair follicles in my forehead are unaffected, right? Only the cells that have the particular receptors are going to respond, and that's one of the cool things about using hormones as a signaling molecule versus using an electrical signal. Uh, in the nervous system, each nerve, like a wire, will be connected to just one specific endpoint. Uh, when you put a chemical signal into the blood, it has access to every cell in your body and you can have multiple different tissues respond in multiple different ways to the exact same signal. Uh, just a quick bit of uh, terminology here that uh, you might find useful when studying the endocrine system is to understand the difference between an endocrine and an exocrine uh, gland. And so what endocrine means is that the end products, these hormones uh, from these uh, endocrine tissues, are being released directly into the bloodstream. So here you can see a little capillary here um, that's taking in those hormones and sending them off to the rest of the body. Whereas an exocrine gland uh, will have its own blood supply, but it's not secreting its end products into the blood. It's secreting it into some separate duct. And you learned about that uh, in earlier biology courses when you looked at something like the pancreas. You may remember that the pancreas is involved in digestion by making digestive enzymes. So here you can see some exocrine cells that are making digestive enzymes like lipase and pancreatic amylase, and those will then end up in this duct we call the pancreatic duct, and that's ultimately going to just be injected into the small intestines for digestion. What's cool about the pancreas is that in other regions of the same organ, uh, it has endocrine glands as well. Uh, and those are called the islets of Langerhans. And so here you can see a little uh, micrograph image of it. And the islets of Langerhans consist of alpha and beta cells, which work together to maintain your blood sugar levels. We'll return to that a little bit later in the lesson. So let's meet a couple of these uh, uh, hormones. And so you've got protein-based ones being shown in a few different ways here. Uh, one involved in the stress response, another one we studied last in my last video, uh, looking at water and sugar balance, looking at water and salt balance, and another one, uh, the human growth hormone involved in growth and development. Uh, here you can see uh, the other type, the steroid hormones, and generally those are uh, derived from cholesterol. Remember, this is a lipid, not a protein. And these slight changes to the arrangement of functional groups can make a whole host of different types uh, of hormones that bind to different receptors. So here's kind of the lay of the land for them. Some of them are, we call them the sex hormones, and uh, others are involved in things like your stress response. Okay, and I'm not talking necessarily just about, oh, I'm so stressed out, but let's say a physical trauma as well. You'll release these to start the healing process. Uh, and so here's what a typical signal cascade might look like from these different types of hormones. It's important to note that some of those hormones, in particular the protein 
uh, based ones are water soluble, meaning that they dissolve easily into your blood and can be transported through the body quite easily. The problem with being water soluble is that that means you generally can't get through a membrane. And so if you're water soluble, your receptor is probably going to be embedded in a membrane. Your only way in is through this receptor changing its 3D shape and causing some other molecule, a second messenger, uh, to do the job inside of the cell. Uh, versus our steroid hormones, which are mostly nonpolar, and as a result, many of them can actually slip right through a cell membrane. Uh, they have a little more trouble moving through the blood and oftentimes need assistance from a protein that helps them get transported, but once they arrive at their target, they can actually enter directly into the cell. And that's usually where their receptor is waiting, either in the cytoplasm, like you see in this case, uh, or sometimes even in the nucleus. But uh, generally, that's the end uh, target for the steroid hormones, is that they're making their way towards the nucleus, and they change gene expression. Uh, think of things like turning on or off the genes to start puberty. And so this entire complex system is made up of all kinds of different organs, all of these endocrine glands releasing their own hormones into the blood. Uh, but there is a little bit of coordination between them, and in particular, it's at this really neat interface between your brain and the endocrine system through this little guy here called the pituitary gland. And so oftentimes, people talk about the pituitary gland as kind of like the hormone control center. And that's because it is directly interfacing with that electrical signaling uh, system. This is by far the most complex integrator you have, and it can uh, process lots of complex information to make some kind of an intelligent response. And so the hypothalamus is actually kind of part uh, neuron and part endocrine system. Uh, rather than it releasing neurotransmitters from the hypothalamus, those nerve endings in the hypothalamus release hormones, some of them directly into the bloodstream to affect targets throughout the body, and others are being released directly into this endocrine gland, the pituitary gland, that's going to start to uh, make its own hormones to control the rest of the system, tell it what to do and when to do it in a much more calculated way than otherwise possible. And so here's a bit of the uh, anatomy of that system a little bit more uh, clear. So here you can see all that complex interacting system of neurons. Those are the brain cells using electrical signals. And at the base of it, a lot of those nerve endings will end up here in the hypothalamus, which can uh, take those complex decisions and interface directly with an endocrine gland here at the pituitary. And when we zoom in, you can see that there's both an anterior and a posterior lobe of that pituitary gland anterior meaning towards the front okay, and posterior meaning towards uh, the back of the body and so they work slightly differently so let's take a quick look at the posterior pituitary gland which in and of itself isn't really an endocrine gland in that it's not really producing its own enzymes it's more of a, a spot where the nerve endings from the hypothalamus can interface directly with the blood and put a signal in there. Uh, it can also store some uh, enzymes, uh, some hormones. So the two most common ones we talk about uh, being dealt with in the posterior pituitary gland uh, are here we can release stored up ADH in response to dehydration. Uh, this is also where uh, electrical stimulation uh, from something like uh, the cervix during childbirth uh, can directly allow the hypothalamus to release oxytocin into the blood. Uh, that's a bit of a, a memory of pressure from last week. So pressure on the cervix sends an electrical impulse to the brain. Uh, the brain uh, processes that information and makes its way to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus releases oxytocin, which is going to cause the uterus to start to contract. As the uterus contracts more, increase the pressure on the cervix, positive feedback until we've released enough oxytocin that those contractions are strong enough to push the baby out. And interestingly, that exact same signal to push the baby out, okay, oxytocin, is also going to stimulate at the same time target cells in the uh, mammary glands in the breasts, which is going to start to produce the baby's first meal, milk. 
The anterior pituitary gland is really the endocrine part. This is the one that's actually making its own um, uh, hormones. And so the hypothalamus will have the electrical stimulation of these neurons. At their nerve endings, they're going to release a hormone of their own, but that hormone's only target is the anterior pituitary itself, saying, okay, it's time to control this, that, or the other uh, endocrine gland. So to make that sort of two-step process a little more clear to you, let's zoom in a bit more specifically on what's happening to the thyroid gland. That's a classic example to understand pituitary control. So what the thyroid is regulating is your metabolic rate. And just so you know what that is, we're talking about the speed at which you're processing your cellular energy. And so if you increase that uh, metabolic rate, you're going to generate a little bit more body heat. And if you decrease it, uh, you're going to bring that body heat back down. And so uh, there's a few different signals being monitored by your brain at any given time. So uh, firstly, how much thyroid gland is currently in your blood. We need to keep that at homeostatic levels to maintain your metabolic rate. But also, if your body temperature starts to cool, you're going to want to ramp that up. And so it's monitoring all these factors simultaneously. And if your thyroid hormones go down or your body temperature goes down, the hypothalamus is going to release TRH, which is the thyroid releasing hormone. And it's going to release it directly into the anterior pituitary. And there's a change now. The anterior pituitary is now going to activate the cells that produce TSH. Uh, the thyroid stimulating hormone. And so that thyroid stimulating hormone is now going to make its way through the thyroid gland, uh, through the bloodstream, and now the thyroid gland is going to upregulate its hormones that actually do the job of increasing your metabolic rate. And so there's two examples of some hormones that it produces, T3 and T4, which is uh, triodo, uh, triiodothyronine and thyroxine. And they each work in slightly different ways, but ultimately they work together to increase the metabolic rate. And so when that happens, uh, we either go back to normal levels of T3 and T4, or we go back to normal body temperature. And so this is negative feedback that's going to stop the release of TRH, which is going to then slow down and eventually stop the production of TSH, which is going to uh, continue to keep this in a perfect homeostatic level. So that's a kind of typical theme of how the pituitary can control an endocrine gland. Uh, but please note that not all endocrine glands are controlled by the pituitary. So a classic example is for us to come back to the pancreas. Um, remember I said that in the pancreas are these islets of Langerhans and in there you've got the alpha and the beta cells which do have endocrine activity they release hormones into the blood and what they're doing is maintaining your blood sugar levels the beta cells are producing a hormone called insulin and the alpha cells are producing a hormone called glucagon and together those hormones have opposite effects which can keep you at exact homeostatic levels. Let's see how it works. So your blood glucose levels should always be around 90 milligrams per 100 mils of blood. If you eat a meal, that number of course is going to go up. Increased levels of blood sugar are going to be detected by the beta cells of your pancreas, which is going to tell it to produce the hormone insulin. The targets for insulin are your body cells it's going to say uptake more glucose from the blood and in particular your liver it's going to say store that glucose for the day in the form of glycogen and both of these actions are taking glucose out of the blood so your blood sugar level should come back down to 90 milligrams per 100 mils fairly quickly uh, the problem is that in between meals later in the day, when you've used up the glucose that was in these cells, you need to get more. And so you start taking it up from the blood. But if this number dips, you're going to have some problems. You need a different hormone that's going to have the opposite effect on the liver. Don't store more glycogen. Break down that glycogen back into glucose to replenish my blood sugar levels. So if we go below 90 milligrams per 100 mil, now it's the uh, 
alpha cells of the pancreas that are going to respond, and they're going to produce glucagon. And glucagon is going to tell the liver to break down that glycogen and release that glucose back into the blood to keep us at our homeostatic levels. And so all this is linked to the very fascinating and highly prevalent disease, diabetes mellitus. And there's actually three different types of diabetes, and I can't get into all the gory details in the context of this video, but I want to go over some of the overarching pictures of them. Uh, so the first type of diabetes is called type 1, and it affects only about 10% of the people who have diabetes in general. Uh, this is a condition that is autoimmune, meaning that your own immune system breaks down your own beta cells. And this generally means that you can't produce your own insulin. In that case, you're going to be an insulin-dependent diabetic, meaning that you need to take injections to get your insulin at the appropriate times. Uh, and of course, that can't be prevented. Uh, type 2 diabetes, which affects about 90% of the people uh, who currently have diabetes uh, mellitus, is a little bit different in that you're still producing your own insulin and at the beginning of this disease sometimes even normal levels the problem is that your body is not responding to that insulin correctly and you're not optimally using it and as the disease progresses this tends to get worse and worse and nobody knows the exact cause uh, as to how or why this is happening uh, some suspect that it may even be linked to things like diet where we have have gotten so used to perpetually high uh, blood sugar levels that now we've uh, started to habituate uh, to the high levels of insulin in our blood and our cells are desensitized to it. They stop responding. Um, that said, there's also a suspected genetic component in that this runs in families. And so I'm actually very surprised, almost shocked to see that in this particular infographic produced by the World Health Organization, uh, they're definitively writing here that type 2 diabetes can be prevented. Uh, if I was making this graphic, I would put a big fat maybe in this spot right here, in that uh, we have a, a long history of blaming people with type 2 diabetes uh, for having that condition as a result of their own uh, lifestyle but we actually don't know with any degree of contents uh, the actual cause of this disease and so I'm very cautious not to do that uh, but it is very well known that you can reduce your risks of getting type 2 diabetes by following a few simple lifestyle choices like a moderate degree of exercise uh, trying to maintain an appropriate body weight your healthy body weight uh, and uh, having a healthy and balanced diet generally one that's not particularly high um, in simple sugars. Um, but let's uh, look at the last one quickly here before I get into the physiology of diabetes, and that's gestational diabetes, which is a particularly uh, interesting one I find in that uh, pregnant women the, can sometimes develop a form of diabetes where the amount of insulin that they're producing and or their sensitivity to it uh, is not enough to deal with their blood sugar regulation uh, during pregnancy. And this can cause serious health consequences for both mother and baby, uh, though it does generally resolve on its own after the pregnancy is finished. So what actually happens to you if you're not producing or you're not responding to insulin? Well, this generally is going to result uh, in a condition where you're going to have increased amounts of glucose in the blood. And so now that you have this large amount of glucose in the blood that you can't uptake uh, into the liver to store as glycogen and you can't uptake into your cells, well, that's going to create this strong osmotic gradient. Uh, water is now going to be drawn out of your cells and into the blood. And so this can do all kinds of things. Uh, first and foremost, you might start to notice that you're getting really, really thirsty and needing to pee all the time. Uh, another interesting uh, factor is that when that uh, urine is being formed in the kidneys, generally the proximal tubule is where you reabsorb 100% of the glucose. But since there's so much glucose in the blood, there's not enough time in the proximal tubule to reabsorb all of it. And so one of the uh, earliest tests that you can do for the uh, early onset of type 2 diabetes is a simple urine test that's going to look for the presence of glucose in the pee. Now there's a whole host of other complications that go along with this. Um, and maybe I'll get you to do a little bit of research on that this week to understand this, this disease a little bit better. Uh, but for now, uh, I hope that that gives you uh, some interesting info. So one last super interesting thing to look at before we move on from diabetes, and that's that anyone who is an insulin-dependent diabetic, that's someone who needs insulin injections to deal with their diabetes, 
um, is now getting access to better and better technology to help them deal with that. And so that's almost all cases of type 1 diabetes. And in much later progressions of type 2 diabetes, many patients find uh, themselves in a situation where not only uh, are they desensitized to the insulin that they're producing, but they start to produce less and less of their own insulin as their beta cells get exhausted from constant potential overproduction of it. Uh, so many type 2 diabetics uh, end up insulin dependent as well. Uh, much later in their disease progression. But what they can get now uh, is this device here called an insulin pump, which is going to be able to uh, constantly monitor your blood sugar levels digitally. And at the exact appropriate moments, just like your pancreas would be constantly monitoring those levels, uh, it can uh, measure and calculate the exact dose of insulin that you ought to take in that moment. And this prevents the need to be constantly testing yourself manually. And it also makes sure that the dosage that you're getting of insulin uh, is perfectly tailored to your needs. And so our last example uh, of hormones that have these opposite effects uh, is to look at blood calcium. And so we call these antagonistic hormones, these ones with opposite effects, insulin versus glucagon. And in this case, we're going to look at uh, calcitonin versus parathyroid hormone. So really interestingly, we've returned now to the thyroid gland. Once again, this organ doesn't just do one thing. Yes, it is controlled by the pituitary gland uh, when it's dealing with metabolic rate, but when it's dealing with your blood calcium levels, it does it completely independently of the pituitary gland uh, in the same way that the pancreas is able to regulate blood sugar. And that's because embedded in the back of this uh, thyroid gland are four little parathyroid glands which produce an antagonistic hormone to calcitonin. So let's have a look at how these two work together. Your blood calcium level should always be about 10 milligrams per 100 mils. Uh, if that level goes up from something that you ate, uh, you've uptaken some calcium from your food, the thyroid gland is going to detect that and release calcitonin. That's going to tell your bones to start to lay down more bone material using that calcium. And you're also going to be excreting out some of that excess calcium in your pee. Both of those factors are going to bring you back down to 10 milligrams per 100 mils. If for whatever reason your blood calcium levels might start to go down and when that happens the parathyroid gland kicks in and says well, low in calcium make parathyroid hormone or PTH for short and that's going to have the opposite or antagonistic effect to calcitonin where it's going to tell you to break down your bones to release some calcium obvious consequences there over long periods of time. Uh, it's also going to tell your kidneys to uptake more calcium back from the pee. Uh, one other cool uh, side note is that PTH tells the kidney to do a fancy chemistry trick to take uh, one form of vitamin D and change it into a more active form and that active vitamin D being now produced by the kidneys uh, tells the small intestines to increase their uptake of calcium from whatever food you have. So you'll be taking in more calcium than you otherwise would without it. And so together we maintain these homeostatic levels of blood calcium. And so there it is in summary. Uh, the endocrine system is sometimes controlled by the pituitary gland. And that may be simply uh, the hypothalamus releasing some hormones into the posterior pituitary gland in the form of things like oxytocin, and those can act directly on body parts uh, like the cervix or the breasts. And uh, sometimes the pituitary gland uh, controlled by the hypothalamus is going to be this two-step process, releasing hormone and then a tropic hormone or a stimulating hormone which controls another endocrine gland and then that endocrine gland releases the hormones that ultimately work on the final targets. And so we looked at that system when we looked at the, how the thyroid works. And finally, there are some endocrine glands that work completely independently of the pituitary and hypothalamus uh, and do the job all on their own. Things like the pancreas, which is regulating blood sugar level with insulin and glucagon, antagonistic hormones. Uh, and the thyroid and the parathyroid gland, which work together by producing calcitonin and parathyroid hormone to maintain your blood calcium levels. So that's it for today, and I hope that that was uh, useful to you. Good luck.